in 38, my father married my mother. Now he was still working as a principal and she was a teacher in the school. They dated for 10 years before they got married. He was beginning to practice law early in their marriage, but he was also going to school and, and working in the school system. So what happened, he started getting more involved in his work. Now most people really think that my father is the first black to start a law practice, but in fact he was not. It was several before him, but the only difference was that they never went to court. And my father had said he would be going to court just like everybody else. He had a chance to practice with one attorney, a Mr. Hentley, for a couple of months before Mr. Hentley died. And all of Mr. Hentley's cases naturally came to my father. Now my father was the only black practice built attorney for 10 to 15 years. And he was doing pretty good, I would say. However, knowing how he loved to work, and he had a family at that time, he opened up a, a nightclub, <laughs> and it was called the Congo, and it was really, really successful. What is so interesting, it was a nightclub at night, and my mother ran a daycare in the daytime. <laughs> I don't know how they got it approved for that. <laughs> now, as his practice began to pick up in the state, he was going over Alabama and neighboring states really talking about voter registration. He became so involved in that that the Board of Education told him that he needed to, to decide, are you going to be a, a principal or are you going to be a lawyer? And they gave him an ultimatum. And you know what he decided? He was going to be a lawyer. His first case that he went to court was in 1939, and that was the Will Hall case. Will Hall was a black labor leader who was put in jail and severely beaten. And he called my father, and my father took the case. A white police officer had beaten him. Now what is unique about this case is that police brutality in the 30s in Alabama and a black attorney on the case. Well, my father took the case to court, and the judge ruled that it was not right for the police officer to beat the man. That judgment should be left up to the courts. So as a result, results, the officer was publicly reprimanded and put on probation. So after the hearing, people were coming around my father, shaking his hand, congratulating him and everything, but the police department had sent a black man in to start a fight. So when my father saw the man coming, he thought he was coming to shake his hand like everybody else. And when he extended his hand, the man took a swing at him and a fight started. They all went to jail. And my mother paid $5 for the fine to get them all out. But the word got out all over Alabama and some of the southern states that it was a black attorney willing to go to court and fight for you. Another early case was a lawsuit with the Board of Registers, where black teachers had gone to register, but they all had been denied to vote. Now at this time, I need five volunteers. If I could get just five people to come up here, I wanna ask you some questions. Come on. Need five people. That's five. Okay, so let's stand in front. Do I have five? One, two, three, four, five. I just need five. Oh, we got six. We're going to sort of come around. We're going to do a little role play and see if you all will be able to pass the test and register to vote. I'm the white registrar. You all are the colors coming to take the test, okay? What's your name? Arkela J. Seal Howard. Okay, Arkela, whatever your name is. How many bubbles are in this bar of soap? Take a look at it. Tell me how many bubbles you can get out of that soap. 
Uh, Glenn Blanchard. Okay, John Henry, come on up. How long have you lived in the county? Uh, two months. That's too short. Oh. What about you, Miss? How, what's your name? Brown Murray. Okay, BB. How long have you lived? Six years. That's just about right. We're going to give you the right to vote. Let's give them all a hand. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. You see what, what happened is that it was really up to the registers to decide who got the vote and who didn't vote. Now, on one occasion, a little elderly old black man came up to vote. He was all bent over on his little stick and everything, had on his best Sunday go to meeting suit, and so he walked up. And when he got to the register, he, he stood up straight, straight his tie. And so the register said, recite the Constitution. So the little black man cleared his voice, held his head up, and started reciting the Gettysburg Address. And the man didn't know the difference between the Gettysburg Address and the Constitution. And he said, well, he spat in the corner and said, well, I didn't know it was a Negro in, in Alabama who knew the Constitution, and he didn't know it himself. So it was really up to them as to who passed and who did not pass. Now, there's a letter in your packet for the FBI, not the FBI, but the uh, police chief sent a letter to the FBI saying that my father was a person who needed to be watched. They got a lot of stuff wrong. They said my dad was 5'8", he was about 5 feet tall, 5'1", if he was wet. They said he weighed 108 and he never weighed over 135 pounds in his life. But what was happening, the word was getting out more and more about my father, and it was really catching the attention of the Klan. My father traveled all over the southern states talking about voter registration and the importance of voting. He went to Atlanta and spoke to the students over there and to the community. And within a couple of days, the coordinator sent my father a letter saying that never before had they had so many people line up to register to vote, that it went all the way around the corner and for blocks people were registering to vote. 1942, he filed a lawsuit on behalf of a black school principal to require Jefferson County to eliminate discriminating salaries between blacks and whites. The whites were getting three and four times more than the black teachers, even though they had the same credentials and the same experiences. My father won this case in federal court, but can you imagine how long it took them to comply? It took them four years for the board to comply. In 1942, my father ran for state legislature, but at that time, it was fewer than a thousand black voters who were registered to vote. He lost, but the word got out. Now, one important case that he argued, and this was the first case he argued all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and this was in 1944, and it was Bester Steele versus l &M Rail Railroad. <laughs> In order to get a promotion with the railroad, you had to belong to the union. Well, Mr. Steele had been working for the uh, l &N for years. He had trained a lot of the whites coming in, and they had become his supervisor, but he could never get a promotion. 
My father took this case all the way to the Supreme Court and won. And this case set the groundwork for Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You all ready to go to Birmingham now? Well, in 1917, the U.S. Supreme Court had outlawed racial zoning. But here in Birmingham, we had our own zoning laws. The population was growing here in Birmingham between 1924 and 1926. It had drastically increased. In 26, the city attorneys and city commissioners thought that they would draw up new lines and ordinances as to where blacks could still live. They said blacks could buy property anywhere, but they could not build homes and have a residence in those areas that was designated white and zoned for whites. And most of the land they had designated for the blacks were in flood areas, across from uh, plants, railroad crossings, and things like that. And it only represented 15% of the land. But in 1947, blacks made up 40% of the population here in Birmingham. So you can see it was getting pretty crowded here. Now, where was Dynamite Hill and what was the dividing line? If you travel north up Center Street, Center Street was a dividing line between where blacks could live and whites could live. Black whites could live on the west side of Center Street and blacks on the east side of Center Street. But blacks bought land on the west side thinking that they could build and, and everything was okay. As soon as they would start building, they could not get what they call a certificate of occupancy. So when that happened, a man by the name of Mr. Matthews in 1947 contacted my father because he could not get a certificate of, of occupancy. So what my father did, he changed, went to court, and the ordinance was to rule unconstitution, unconstitutional what the Birmingham City Commissioners had done. And it ruled that blacks could move on the west side of anywhere. Well, when Mr. Matthews got ready to move into the house, it was bombed immediately. This happened quite often. Every time my father would win the case about getting that law changed, they would change, go back to court again. But as a result, blacks started moving into what they called Dynamite Hill. And as soon as they would move in, before they could move in, the house was bombed or set on fire. Now one person that they said was really involved in this <clears throat> was a man by the name of Dynamite Bob, Bob Chambliss. He would brag about the houses being bombed, uh, houses being burned, and he was a member of the Klan. Nobody ever arrested him. Can anybody imagine after the bombing of 40 to 50 homes in the area. What stopped the bombing? Well, blacks got a little smart. They got a white friend to infiltrate the Klan. And they found out when the next bombing was going to take place. So they hid out in a field across the street. And when the Klan came to bomb the house, <clears throat> firepower was released. One white was killed, several were injured, and it never made the newspaper. <clears throat> Excuse me. This stopped the bunny until 1963. In 51, the white business leaders pressed the officials to find out and prosecute those who were responsible for the racial bunnies and to try to explore racial reform. They started an interracial committee made up of moderate blacks, and they met. They were successful in a few things. They uh, were able to desegregate the city center office building. They built a black hospital, parks, golf course, playgrounds, and the black doctors could join the Alabama Medical Association. Because of this increased activity, the Klan became more active and their numbers continued to grow. 
my father and a friend sometimes would accompany my father down to certain places in these rural southern areas. And they were in South Alabama. And my father won the case. And coming out, whites had lined both sides of the, of the uh, courthouse. My father always drove a Cadillac because he said it was a heavy car and it was fast. And the friend, I remember him telling us that my father would always put the pedal, metal to the pedal and leave them in dust because they were all on dirt roads and they always were able to make it out. Now in the late 1940s, the local NAACP and my father continued voting challenges and they won. But all of these victories contributed to the increase of the Klan. It grew from 700 in 1946 to 6,500 in three years. And at one time here in Birmingham, the NAACP had about 8,000 members. And they had long sponsored the, uh, the uh, legal challenges. <laughs> However, after all of the bombings and what the NAACP had been doing, the, it dropped off dramatically. The numbers dropped off because there were so many bombings going on. And then the state of Alabama banned the NAACP in 1956. And after this, the civil rights movement moved from moderate blacks, basically, who were going through the courts for regress to more active participation of different organizations. Now, as my father's practice picked up, he and my mother decided that they were going to build a house and move. My mother said, let's go to Michigan. We wouldn't have all these problems. But my father said, no, he was going to stay here and fight. This was the first big argument I heard my family or my parents really discuss. They sort of compromised. They stayed here in Alabama. They did move on the west side of Center Street. They were on the east side, and that sort of pacified my mother for a while. And you can see a picture of our house in the handout. Now, Thurgood Marshall was a, a constant visitor in the house, a friend. And he knew that my sister loved cowboys. So when he was there, he would be on all four, and my sister would be riding his back, hitting his rear, saying, giddy up, horse. And they would go all the way around the room. Now, in 1942, Thurgood Marshall, Constance Motley, and my father were their attorneys for Arthur Ray Lucy in entering the University of Alabama. That was in 1952, but their mission was not granted until 1954. Now, during that time, the family received so many threats. There was riots going on down in Tuscaloosa. We couldn't give our phone numbers out to many people because we were getting threatening calls all the time. So we would tell our friends and family that if you call, let it rain twice and hang up and then call back again and we would know that that was you and not something else. We received terrible hate mail all the time and I can always remember this one letter that my father received and it was addressed to the nigger on the hill inside there was a stick drawing of a man being hung from a tree with a knife sticking in his heart with blood dripping saying we're going to get you next while the Lucy case was was going on the blacks community got together and they started a patrol. Well, they would patrol all around the neighborhood and especially around our house. We were really on high alert. We had people outside station and also inside station. Nobody told me they were inside. So one night I was running down the steps to press clothes for the next day and this Fairly large man was sitting in the chair with a double barrel shotgun in his hand, arms, and he was asleep. He scared me. I scared him. He pointed the shotgun at me and I screamed and I think I grew feathers or wings on my back because I flew up the steps. 
Now while the men were guarding the house, they would come after work, and they had different times that they would come, but they were there after work until early morning. Helen and I were taken to school every morning and picked up every day. But I attended a one-room schoolhouse here in Birmingham, and one day a white man came in a pickup truck, very dirty, and he said, told the teacher he was there to pick me up. And the teacher knew that he was not the person that was supposed to pick me up. So she called my father, and my father said, no, that's the wrong man. No, don't let her go. And he was very insistent, but he couldn't tell with about 50 or 60 kids in the room who was Father Shores. So he eventually left, but that was like an attempted kidnapping on my life. Now, my sister, on the other hand, was one to always push the envelope. She would let them take her to school, but she was hell-bent on walking home. Why did she want to walk home? She wanted to walk home with a boyfriend <laughs> and her other friends, which she did. Now, while all of us were uh, away during the day, my mother was at home by herself. She was always frightened but she was very supportive of my father, and she was sort of the glue that held the family really together. And I really called her the silent warrior. Now my father was one of the lawyers on the uh, NAACP lawyers for the Brown versus the Board of Education case. And he just continued doing cases like that. Now I think all of you all were too young to remember the series of Gunsmoke and Palatin with have gun will travel. Well, I was in the den watching TV, watching this, the movie. All the gunfight had stopped, and all at once I heard the gunshots coming through the window. But I knew the routine. My father said that if anything happened, to crawl to safety, hit the floor, crawl to safety, and that's what I did. When the police came, they said, it's nothing we can do. You know, and they would just, they wouldn't look for any evidence or anything. So we knew we had to really protect ourselves. Now my parents really tried to do everything to keep things as normal for us as possible. We had to take dance lesson, ballet, we had to take piano lesson. I hated piano lesson and Helen hated dance lesson. But my father was there at every recital with his Polaroid camera taking pictures. Now Helen went to the first Girl Scout Roundup and one of her friends, Angela Davis, who was also in the troop, was one of the troop members who went with her. I went to the second Girl Scout Roundup in Budden Bay, Vermont. They had a train to pick us up that had gone all over Alabama and Birmingham was the last stop. When the white Girl Scouts got on, they got on one train car, and we got into the last train car. Well, we were happy in our little car, and they were happy in their car. But once the train pulled out, they came to our car. And we were laughing and talking about Elvis Presley, hair dances and things like that. And even when we got to Vermont, we seemed to get along well. But in coming back to Birmingham, it changed. They didn't come to our car anymore and we did not go to their car. And once we got off the train, we went in our separate ways. Now every Sunday after church and after dinner, my daddy would take us on a drive, a Sunday drive. We'd see the new houses that were coming up, new developments, and just drive around waving at relatives and friends and everything. We would always pass by this park called Kitty Land Amusement Park. And Helen would say, oh, Daddy, please stop. I want to go. You can smell the, the, the cotton candy, the popcorn. The kids just looked like they were having such a great time. And my father told her, no, we couldn't go because you're black. And she screamed and said, well, I wish I was white so I could go. And he said, baby, don't wish you were white. Just wish you could go. We took part in another organization. It was called the Jack and Jill Club of America. And this was sort of like a family club, <coughs> excuse me, 
but we learned different things. Every age group had a club meeting every month. With us, we did, we wrote plays, we took uh, educational tours, we had people to come and lecture us, we learned about Robert's Rules of Order. We even had regional and national conferences that we would attend. That was a good outlet for us. And my mother was always to have different lavish parties. <clears throat> when Helen was about nine years old, my mother had a birthday party for Helen. All of the girls came in formal dresses, and the boys had on their best suits. My mother also liked to have good parties. She would have what we would call a come as you are party, and it was always during the holiday. Three or four, four of us would have a list of about 20 people to call and tell them, come just as you are to Dodie's house. It's come as you are party. Now, when the party first started off, ladies would come there with their men, the, the husband's pajamas on, stuff all on their face and everything. They came just as they were. But after two or three years, they started waiting for my mother to call. They started coming in silk pajamas, Kid Moss said it's coming in the door like Loretta Young, but it was a good time. One time, <coughs> excuse me, my father would always take us on vacations every summer. We would go down to Florida. On one trip that we were going down, a car kept trying to run us off the road. And so my mother told him, just pull off and see what the man wants. Well, it was a liberated white man who stumbled to the door, to the car. And he said, I just wanted to know, what was this white woman doing in the car with this nigga and these pig in the back seat? I could see my father slowly moving his hand to the glove compartment where he kept the gun. And my mother put her hand down and said, just drive off shores, which we did. My mother was very fair skinned <clears throat> and often mistaken for white. And she never tried to pass or do anything like that. Now, on one occasion, my father took my sister down to get a driver's license. Well, she failed. So then my mother took her down to get her license and she passed. And the examiner said, Well, I know your mate needs her job. It needs to be able to come to your house. So I just went on and passed her anyway. Mm -hmm. I tell her she needs to practice her, her parallel part. Oh, so after that, it became a joke in the family. If you wanted to pass your exam, get my mama to take you down there. Mm -hmm. 